everyone, welcome to the Libertarian Advisor Show. This is episode number one, so thank you for tuning in. So now that the post-election uh, you know, euphoria for at least me and uh, many others around the country has, uh, I don't want to say worn off, but you know, the initial shock is now kind of over. Uh, you know, one thing I think is to keep in mind is that, you know, it's great that Trump was able to win. You know, I worked incredibly hard to make sure that was the case. But, you know, the, the battle has just begun. I mean, that was the first battle that uh, just took place. But now the real work begins because if we all just go to sleep for another, you know, three years, two years, you know, what have you, four years, then, you know, we need to make sure that we hold these politicians feet to the fire. We got to make sure that Trump doesn't get a whole bunch of neocons in there. And one thing that kind of disturbed me is on my uh, Facebook page, forward slash The Libertarian Advisor, I had this meme where it was kind of, uh, you know, you know, you guys seen the 300 movie where it's got, you know, the one guy going up against, you know, uh, you know, kind of against all odds. Well, I guess, you know, it's 300 people in the movie, but this one meme uh, in this case had one person. But what people were misconstruing about that is, you know, well, A, I think some people thought that I was, you know, a butthurt libertarian who who thought that, you know, Gary Johnson had some sort of chance at winning this when, you know, because of Gary Johnson's own missteps that have been documented, you know, a hundred times over, whether it was other, you know, vlogs I made, whether it was other, uh, you know, YouTube videos I made. Uh, so, you know, quick rehash. I mean, he supported TPP. That's an anathema to libertarians. Uh, he had a bunch of milk toast things to say, uh, you know, during his entire message. He had a great things. He is in Bill Weld and Gary Johnson, both on numerous occasions, had great things to say about Hillary Clinton. So I think that, you know, anyone who's a true libertarian, you know, cannot be going around saying great things about, you know, Hillary Clinton, who has left a path of death and destruction everywhere she's gone. So, you know, I knew that these that those two jackasses, you know, did not represent libertarianism. And I knew that with Trump, he at least represented somebody that, you know, basically wasn't going to be bought off. And if he could do things like, you know, draining the swamp, if he could do things like having a constitutional amendment to, uh, you know, imp enact term limits, and, you know, if he can just, you know, in his own good conscience, do what he thinks is going to be best for the country without being bought off, then guess what? We have a chance for, for some sort of prosperity. And the problem I had with the, you know, you know, more traditional libertarians, and by traditional, I don't mean the, the purists, because most of them were out uh, as well. But what I mean is, you know, a lot of these people are people that maybe just found out about libertarianism. Uh, and now all of a sudden, you know, they think that they're the experts in this stuff. But when it comes to, you know, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, I mean, it was an embarrassment to the point where I didn't even want to have libertarian almost in my in my name, because I, th I was so disappointed in both of those guys when I was, you know, doing everything I could in 2012 to alert as many people about Gary Johnson as possible. And I knew back then I didn't have any, you know, grandiose ideas of thinking he was going to win. Uh, you know, I was just trying to, you know, not deviate from my own philosophies, my own core principles, and try to get, you know, you know, more recognition for the brand. This time, you know, granted, I think, you know, they're up like, you know, three, four hundred percent from last time, which is going from, you know, one to you know, maybe three and a half percent. But, you know, to take a victory lap on that when both the two uh, traditional parties had, you know, record, record low, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, approval ratings, record low dissatisfaction amongst them. And if the Libertarian Party wants to take a victory lap on three and a half percent, you know, great. Uh, you guys are going to be stuck down there for a long time. But what I'm interested in is with Trump now that he's in. And what I meant by that meme kind of going circling back to that 360 is that, you know, if we all, you know, just let Trump do whatever he wants and let him get away with putting, you know, neocons in there, I'm not saying he's going to, but we didn't make sure he's not going to be giving away, you know, the keys to the kingdom to any neocons, to any globalists, you know, no Chris Christie's, uh, you know, that's the last thing that we are going to need. And the other point is, you know, and what I'm fearful is, is that, you know, basically I think Jesus could be elected and you know he's not gonna be able to turn things around i mean we've gotten into such bad dire straight position financially and you know if some of you are thinking oh man well how can that be you know everything's going great well you know do i have some videos for you i mean you can start by going to the libertarian where you can find 
different articles on how the GDP is rigged, how the inflation rate is rigged, how the unemployment rate is rigged, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, and that those aren't the only ones. And another one is how the polls are rigged. And I think that after this election, I mean, why anybody would take the media seriously is absolutely beyond me. I mean, they didn't get one fucking thing right about this. And another thing about, you know, all these exit polls, you know, how can you have HuffPost saying, you know, 98% certainty, you know, you know, this outlet, that outlet, they're all, you know, damn near, you know, 80, 80 something percent and above saying Trump had no chance of winning this whatsoever. And I think what that did was it helped. Um, you know, on the one hand, I'm wondering, you know, maybe some Hillary Clinton supporters didn't actually uh, show up to vote because the media had already told them that, you know, it was a foregone conclusion. So, you know, hey, am I going to go, you know, stop doing whatever I'm doing to go stand in line to go vote for someone that's definitely going to win? I don't know. Uh, the other thing it may have done is it may have taken people that that wanted to vote for for Trump. But maybe they're weak minded people. So maybe they ended up voting for Hillary because, you know, everybody wants to, you know, vote for the winner. You know, it's sort of like, you know, your favorite sports team when you've got a bunch of people that don't give a shit, you know, 99% of the time. And now all of a sudden, you know, they're on the, some historic, you know, path to uh, the championship. And now, you know, they've got 10 times the support than they usually do. Uh, so I think that, you know, that may have been the case. But, you know, I had a whole video on how the polls were rigged. Um, so, you know, again, not to rehash that whole thing, but it all has to do with, uh, and it's funny cause actually after that video that I made, I ended up getting called by the polls. And when it comes to, you know, the, the democratic candidate, there was about 10 follow-up questions to everything when it came to the Republican candidate. Uh, and again, this was actually more like on a local level. So that's why I'm saying the, the candidate, because I know a lot of you aren't in that region, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but you know, it would be like, okay, you know, Republican answer. All right, who cares? All right, move along. But then for the Democrats, it's like, well, can you elaborate a little bit more on this? And 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 then like ten other whys to really try to boil down and get to the root cause of something. Whereas you know the Republicans, they could really give two shits about that. But you know what I'm trying to do is you know just wake people up to how this whole system is a fraud. You know whether it's how they count the votes, whether it's how they do the polls, whether it's how they give you the cook numbers to begin with. I mean, it's all BS, whether it's the actual monetary system itself. I mean, everything is rigged. And for all these Republicans who are happy that Trump is in office, which, you know, I can I'm in the camp that is happy that Trump is in office, that, um, you know, we can't just fall asleep for three years. We can't just fall asleep for four years. We need to make sure he does the things that he says he's going to do. And luckily, the bar has been set so low for him coming on the heels of uh, W and Obama when Obama was pretty much anointed as the second coming of Christ. And instead of, you know, following through on many of his promises, like, you know, whether it was, you know, decreasing NSA spying, like, oh, you know, we actually increased it. Whether it's being the most transparent, oh, we actually jailed more people under the Espionage Act than every other president combined. You know, whether it's ending wars, oh, well, actually, I just started a whole bunch of new ones and other ones that American citizens aren't even aware of. You know, whether it's, you know, not, you know, coming after gun rights, well, you guys may have lost on most fronts, but you guys certainly were doing that. You know, and, you know we're going to make other countries, uh, you know, respect us again. You know, that certainly isn't, isn't the case. So it's just, you know, we're going to restore civil liberties. Well, Obama enacted something called the National Defense Authorization Act, which was also authored by John McCain. So, you know, we'd be, you know, damned either way, you know, how people voted in 2008, that, um, you know, any American can be killed and detained with no judge and no jury. I mean, that's not liberal at all. I mean, so, you know, he came in like the second coming of Christ and people are still giving him a free pass on, on how great his, you know, everything he everything he do, did was, whereas for Trump, you know, it's basically people think it's the second coming of Hitler. So, you know, if he were to get in there and do nothing, well, nothing would probably be a whole hell of a lot better than, you know, doing going in there and doing a whole bunch of bad shit like we knew would be the case if Hillary Clinton was was uh, in power. So from a libertarian perspective, if Trump actually is going to appoint constitutionalists, if he actually is going to appoint, you know, judges that are in the vein of an Antonin Scalia, then I think that'd be a great thing. But, you know, if we had somebody like Hillary come in and, you know, put five more Ruth Bader Ginsburg's in there, 
if we had her start World War Three with Russia, you know, if we have her coming in and taking the guns, you know, if we have her make all the illegals uh, legal, and then all of a sudden we've got this permanent underclass that you know has been you know propagandized seven ways to Sunday to you know basically voting for their own enslavement. You know, there would never be a libertarian future, and I wouldn't say never, but you know, the road would be you know ten times harder. And you know, and so for me, looking at the bigger picture, and you know, maybe some people say I'm not a purist because I could potentially vote for somebody like Trump. Well, the fact is, it's because I'm a purist that I couldn't vote for Gary Johnson because his things are just an anathema to me. But we've got a lot of things to unwind with with Obama and. What I'm fearful is is that the central bankers are going to you know pull something on him. I mean, if you look at the history of central banking, and again, I'm not even looking at any notes for this, but you had you know the first one ended in 1812. The British came over here, burned down the fucking White House because they were the ones who openly owned it. The second Central Bank of America was ended by Andrew Jackson, who said, "You are a you know den of vipers, and by eternal God, I shall rout you out." And then, you know, he was attempted to be assassinated twice. The guy said it was wealthy European bankers who put it up to him. But once he did get in power, the second central bank president at the time was named Nicholas Biddle. And he did all sorts of shenanigans like pull the credit, try to crash the economy, did crash the economy. And since, you know, you don't have, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook back then uh, and, you know, and probably any media that you did have was probably going to be better than the media you have today, which, you know, is saying basically nothing. And, uh, you know, the average person didn't really understand what was going on and try to blame Jackson for that. So what, what we need Trump to do is to get out ahead of this. And I know he has done this where he's called for auditing the Fed, you know, via some tweets where he was, uh, you know, jabbing at who was it? Uh, what's the guy's name? The, the holier than thou uh, Ted Cruz. So, you know, he said, you know, something to the effect of, you know, so important, we audit the Fed, how could you miss that vote? So, you know, I don't know, hopefully he wasn't just taking a jab at Ted Cruz, and hopefully this is something that he philosophically wants to do. But the good part is we've got guys like Alex Jones who are in his ear, who knows exactly what's going on with the Fed. So I am, I am hopeful, but, you know, the fact of the matter is we are eight years into this, you know, recovery that I'll say in quotes. And, um, uh, you know, if you want to reference some of my other videos on YouTube, I've got ones on, uh, what is it? It's, uh, you know, I've got, you know, you see these memes going around where it has, you know, talks about what a great job Obama did, whether it was, you know, raising the stock market or, you know, lowering the price of gas or, you know, having the unemployment rate. Well, I have a, it's a 15 minute video that, that completely demolishes that. I've got another, I think it's like three minute video that completely demolishes the fact that he, you know, cut the deficit in half. Uh, so again, I don't care who gets in there. We've got a tough road to deal with the derivatives an absolute mess The Fed's balance sheet is about I think it's like 4.4 trillion last time I checked. It's probably even higher than that now um, So what we went from 800 it took us, you know from 1913 to 2008 to get to 800 billion in Reserves and then only eight years to go from 800 billion to 4.4 trillion So, you know the Fed is leveraged, you know over 80 to 1. It's a complete, you know cluster that once interest rate risk actually, you know, rears its ugly head, it's going to, it's, it's going to unleash just absolute havoc. Uh, and I actually had a question that got passed, uh, that actually got to Janet Yellen, uh, when, uh, Schweiker, my Congress, not my Congressman, but it's the Congressman, um, actually where I work, it'd be the Congressman from where my office is located, but not uh, Phoenix is a pretty big place, so we've got a few of them over here. But one of Phoenix's congressmen uh, took my question from Facebook and asked uh, Janet Yellen. So kind of backing this up a little bit, uh, just to kind of give you guys some you know perspective and how this works, is when you've got the, the Federal Reserve, there's 12 member banks. They're all private banks. Those banks then get a 6% dividend of all the interest of all the debt. So right now, so another way how they spin that is they give back 94% of the profit to the treasury. So right now they're paying out the banks, uh, I don't know, like point, I think it's 0.5% and they're getting, you know, two, two and a half percent. So there's, let's call it, you know, a 2% amount of interest that they're getting off all the, you know, off their 4.4 trillion that they're then pocketing 6% of that. Well, my question was, well, what happens if, you know, inflation takes off and you have to raise rates to, let's say four 
And if we back things up a, up a little bit, you know, four years ago, they said the rates were going to be uh, at 16. Uh, sorry, it would be 16 rate hikes by now, which means, you know, 4%. So obviously that didn't happen. I've been, you know, following Peter Schiff for a long time and agreed with his analysis that, you know, the Fed was, you know, as, as uh, Peter Schiff put it, doing the Teddy Roosevelt uh, approach to things where, you know, instead of, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, you know, they were yelling how big their stick was because they didn't even have a stick. And so my question to Janet Yellen, she actually said that my scenario was impossible. And that, I mean, I mean, I almost fell out of bed when I heard that. I mean, a, a fucking alien invasion is possible. I mean, what is this lady on? So, I mean, she either, you know, she knows it's possible. What she, what she can't let people know is that it's actually probable and it's actually the most probable. But one thing she did say about that was that uh, she said that, well, there is a scenario where if things are taken off so much that we have to raise rates to kind of cool things down. And then under those you know, auspices, then, you know, there might be that, that case where, uh, you know, that scenario might unplay, you know, full, you know, play out. But that would be a great problem to have because, you uh, you know, it'd be a great problem to have because that means things are going great. Well, I can tell you what, Janet Yellen, that's not how things are going to happen. And that's very wishful thinking. So, you know, what Trump needs to hammer on from a central bank perspective is that, uh, you know, from day one, when this was created, the first dollar that was created uh, had 4% interest on it. So at the end of year one, you owe a dollar four. Well, if you only created one dollar, how the hell do you ever pay back a dollar four? Well, now you got to borrow another dollar. And so you create this system where there's always more debt than, than there is money. And so this whole entire, we just need an entire rewrite of this whole thinking, uh, this whole system and how everybody thinks. And, and at the end of the day, we just need to decentralize everything. I mean, decentralize as much as possible. And if it can be decentralized, then it should be. Because every time something gets centralized, you've got the worst elements in government, the worst elements when it comes to just, you know, people in general who want to then, you know, take that over to then, uh, you know, just be able to impose their will and dominate others. Uh, and, you know, when you've got Trump tweeting out about auditing the Fed, you know, auditing the Fed is basically code word for ending the Fed because it's like saying we're going to audit, you know, Anthony Weiner's laptop. Well, guess what? There's probably a lot of sick shit on there. So, you know, if you audit that, there's going to be, you know, a lot of indictments going down, going down for people. And I think it was, uh, you know, Henry Ford had a quote that went something along the lines of, you know, it's, you know, it's well enough that people don't understand the banking system for if they did, there'd be a revolution before the morning. And I think he said that right before the Fed was even created. So, you know, now it's about a million times worse than that. You know, the reason there is in income inequality is because of the fact that the money's being devalued. So if you had, uh, let's say the minimum wage was not, let's say it was $1 in 1960. So let's call it four quarters. Those quarters had actual real silver in them back then until 1964. So if you were to then take those four quarters and pay somebody that today, I mean, that'd be about 17, 18 bucks an hour. So it's just absolutely, you know, ridiculous that the main problem is, is the money itself because our money is not money it's currency uh and it's backed by nothing it's backed by war it's backed by bombs it's backed by the fact that my daughter is already going to be a million dollars in debt because you know we've got a bunch of assholes running things who are trying to enslave us and i think with trump you know if he uses that bully pulpit appropriately i think we've got a chance at getting at getting out of some of this stuff and uh you know speaking of central bank activity i see all these protesters talking about how Trump is going to lead us into fascism. You know, a lot of them are spelling it, you know, completely wrong. Uh, and I think a lot of them are probably too dumb to realize that what Obama has, has done, you know, particularly through Obamacare, is fascism. So when you have the insurance companies and you have the banks who are then writing the law to then give themselves more power and create, you know, monopolies and duopolies everywhere, especially in the case of Arizona, where my insurance uh eight years ago i was paying 70 bucks a month and granted now that i'm married so let's call it you know let's call it 140 maybe even round up to 200 dollars a month uh you know last year i think two years ago i was paying you know 220 for my wife and i then i was paying uh 550 last year well now just got the new rate incre increases 1300 motherfucking dollars so thank you to all these fucking dumbass millennials who promised me i'd have a bill that would be my you know lower than my cell phone bill well, well, now it's like 
it's like my I didn't realize they were talking about like my annual bill was going to be monthly and I see all these people laughing like ha 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 like you've got to figure that out now and it's like you guys don't understand that you guys are killing small business um, and that's another thing I mean Arizona just uh, voted to raise minimum wage to twelve dollars an hour by twenty twenty now I've got interns and and I pay one of them you know eleven bucks an hour because she does a great job for me and I you know want to re- reward her well now eleven bucks an hour is going to be illegal. But what I can do is, if I want to, uh, I can pay interns nothing. So I can pay them nothing, but I'm, but it's illegal for me to pay them ten dollars an hour. I mean, and I would say in almost every case, they are definitely learning more than they're learning, you know, in school in their propaganda factory. So you know, and and I'm paying them to teach them, and it is, and it you know, I'm grateful for the help, but it does take you know a lot of mental energy to have to you know always find something. For them to do, you know, having to, you know, you know, you know, you've got one train of thought and then they come in and they need to stop everything you're doing to then figure out something else for them to do. Uh, so, you know, there is some stress involved in that, you know, stress and keeping payroll, everything else. And it's just like we just keep making things harder and harder and harder. And the end result is I'm just going to outsource everything. I mean, I can get guys, you know, to do, you know, website design over in, uh, you know, England. I can get, you know, payroll companies. I can get, you uh, you know, basically, you know, I have virtual receptionist, you know, you name it, I'm trying to outsource it via third parties, because the most dangerous thing you can do now is pretty much hire somebody with all the new laws that they have. And, you know, and when it comes to, you know, fascism, you've got central banks who are openly buying up the bonds of companies. So that is the actual state and corporate merger known as fascism and it's actually above fascism because those central banks are all privately owned so it's even worse than fascism and i I don't hear a fucking word from any liberals about that and and when i say liberal i don't even mean liberal in the sense of you know classical liberal thomas jefferson i mean authoritarianism because i think a lot of us out there a lot of people listening to this you know from an actual real liberal perspective we probably are classical liberals. Constitutionalists, constitutionalists are classical liberals, um, you know. And these are not liberals. These are these are absolute authoritarian babies. These are brown shirts. And the worst part about it is, they don't even know they're brown shirts. And uh, I think you know when it comes to real liberals, I actually get along with them quite nicely. You know, and when it comes to people like Julian Assange, who, you know, calls out bullshit from the left and the right, when it comes to, you know, I think there was a lady, and we'll cue this up in a post, but there was a lady who was at, uh, I think it was at one of the California conventions, this older lady, probably like, probably like 80 years old, who was a Bernie supporter, and she's not talking about the things that Trump might do, she was talking about the things that Hillary's already done to subvert the democracy, to subvert, you know, the... I don't give a fuck about
with ourselves and build this revolution. Bernie wants to help us build the revolution, but I'm not a sheep for Bernie or anybody else, and I will not spend what few years I've got left on this earth to help someone like Hillary Clinton. So come take my credentials. So you've got all these, you know, babies running around, you know, getting paid from Soros to go stir shit up. And, you know, you've got all this, you know, love Trump's hate. And I just came out with a meme, uh, or not a meme, but it's a probably a four minute video where it, it shows, you know, Hillary with her voice cracking saying, love Trump's hate. And like, her, I did a terrible. Love Trump's hate. Love Trump's hate. Well, there, but. Uh, you know, her voice crackles and then I've got it queued up where you've got, you know, all these, you know, basically Trump supporters getting either the shit kicked out of them or getting, you know, bloodied or beaten up or you know, all these fuck you chants. And every single one I've, I then enter, you know, in between the one clip to the next, I then uh, put the Hillary clip in there. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to the media and the polls and everything else, you know, I'm hoping people are starting to realize it's all bullshit. I mean, I've got my grandparents who are you know, who are all, you know, in a tizzy that Trump was down by 11 points after the second debate with me as their grandson explaining it to them how it's all BS. And, you know, I think one of the worst people I watched from a financial perspective had to be Charlie Gasparino. I mean, that guy's not even right about anything financial related, you know, and he sure as hell is not right about anything Trump related. He kept saying, you know, over and over and over again, you know, Trump can't get past 15 percent. Then he can't get past 20. Then he can't get past 30. Well, then he can't get past 50. Oh, well, then he can't win the general. And we've all seen the clips where it, where it's not just him. It's, you know, basically every single other person out there who is saying that Trump can't win. Well, guess what? We won. You guys are going to have to deal with it. And for the people that did vote Trump, we are going to have to, you know, keep on him. Make sure he doesn't put the neocons in there and realize that the war has just begun. You know, from everything I just told you guys, we've got a hard road to fight. And this is now not the time to let up. And in the future, if I start advocating for candidates that aren't Republicans, which probably is going to happen, uh, you can pretty much bet your dollar on it that uh, that I just want to make sure you guys are paying attention to what you know what's you know what's the best thing to do from a constitutional standpoint. What's the best thing to do from a liberty-based standpoint, and go from go from there. You know, we didn't need to make sure that we open things up so that way it's not just billionaires who are celebrities that have a chance of bucking the system. You know, we need to create an environment where, you know, everyday people can help buck the system, where, you know, we have more voices in, in the debates because, you know, we shouldn't have to take over one of these parties every single time we want to get into the debates. We need to expose how they're frauds. We need to expose how everything is a fraud. And, uh, you know, it's just a Saturday over here, so I'm going to try to enjoy myself now. But, you know, uh, you know, this was a very historic day and, you know, I just wanted to you know, provide some commentary on it because I think some of the things I'm saying are kind of getting misconstrued. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, so happy for everyone that has, you know, helped share all of our information. You know, if you would have told me two months ago when I started this, I'd go from, you know, you know, reaching, you know, 20 people a day to reaching, you know, 800,000 like we did two days ago, you know, I would have laughed at you, you know, 500,000 post engagements. I mean, to put that in perspective, uh, that's more than the entire fucking libertarian party. You know, that's, you know, 10 times more than, you know, townhall.com. That's, you know, we are for an post engagement level. We are approaching, you know, info wars. We're approaching not from, I mean, and it, granted their reach is, you know, a billion times more than me, but strictly from Facebook on that one Avenue, one platform. And again, I'm sharing their stuff too. So, you know, we're trying to, it's not a competition because, you know, I helped get inspired by him. So, you know, we're not, you know, in competition here. And really, I'm trying to build up, you know, a thousand more of me, because we need to expose how this is a fraud. And if we can have, you know, a 1000 people, you know, reaching a 1000 people, that'd be a million. But you know, if we could have, you know, a 1000 people reaching a million people, well, then, you know, there we go, the system would stand no chance. So, you know, don't wait for orders from headquarters, you know, start doing some things on your own, start doing your own activism. And, and more importantly than anything, don't believe what you hear in the media. So, you know, it's been real. Thank you guys for listening to my first ever podcast and hope you guys have uh, you know, a great week. And just remember to make sure we keep Trump's feet to the fire and that he does what he says he does. Because if we do, then we do have a chance to make America great again. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Libertarian Advisor Podcast. 
If you want to support what we are doing, in addition to rating our podcast in iTunes and sharing our articles and links, please consider becoming a client of Focal Point Wealth Management. If you head over to our website at focalpointwealth.com, you will find timely articles as well as links to sign up for our newsletters, as well as a link to find out what your risk number is. And you're probably wondering, what is a risk number? First off, there is no purchase required. You simply click on the link, enter the size of your portfolio, and after a few questions, we will be able to see how much risk you can handle on a scale of 1 to 99, with 99 being the highest. For listeners of this podcast, you can shoot an email to tim, T-I-M, at focalpointwealth.com, where myself or one of my assistants can send you a secure email. If you want to find out how much risk is in your portfolio, along with how much your underlying fees are, what your stress test results look like, and much more, we'd be happy to show you your portfolio's risk number. Again, this is completely free, and whether you invest with us now or in the future, this is incredibly valuable information to have. Our goal is to put you in a portfolio that will be better suited for your goals and maybe save you some money too in the process. I spent a lot of time and energy fighting the globalists and central bankers and investing with people who hold your ideals and who are reinvesting our proceeds to expand our message and further promote liberty and freedom is a win-win all the way around. Lastly, we also have pre-built portfolios starting at just $5,000. You can find the links at focalpointwealth.com or the libertarianadvisor.com on the right-hand side. Look for Guided Wealth Portfolios banners. This is great for millennials who want access to an advisor if they need one, uh, but have the ability to invest without having to talk to one. Remember, at Focal Point Wealth Management, your future is our focus. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member of FINRA slash SIPC. Investment advice offered through Wealthcare Advisory Partners, a registered investment advisor. Wealthcare Advisory Partners and Focal Point Wealth Management are separate entities from LPL Financial. For a list of states in which we are registered to do business, please visit www.focalpointwealth.com. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Please consult with your advisor, tax, or legal consultant before making any investing decisions. Investing does involve risk, including but not limited to potential loss of principal.